how do large corporations pick the sites where they're going to set up shop or move their operations? These large corporations do in-depth studies. They often hire expensive consultants because it matters a lot to them. They're going to be investing millions, if not billions of dollars over the long term, and they need to get it right. So how do they do that? Well, I'm so excited about our guest today. I'm Kathy Fetke. Welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. And welcome back to our YouTube channel. If you like what you're hearing here, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe below. It really helps out with our rankings. Our guest today absolutely has his finger on the pulse of growth in America because he is one of those consultants that the large firms hire. John Boyd Jr. is a principal of the Boyd Company, one of the nation's most trusted and well-known corporate site selection firms. John's commentary on corporate site selection, regional economic development, and the real estate industry is routinely cited in the national business media. I just heard him last week, and he's here with us on The Real Well Show. John, welcome. Kathy, it's great to be with you again. It is so great to have you back here on The Real Wealth Show. I am geeking out. I know some of our audience will be too. So let's start with you and your company. What does the Boyd Company do? Uh, Our firm counsels major U.S. and overseas corporations and private developers where to locate facilities throughout North America. We also have our e-commerce platform, bizcost.com, which helps dozens of companies each month and and developers uh, decide where to do new projects based upon business climate and business cost information. And this is such a hard thing to do, site selection, because as a developer, you're having to look into the future, not just a few years, not just five years, sometimes like decades, right? So what goes into the process of of site selection? Well, you know, we always say site selection is both a science and an art, okay? The science is really the quantitative analytical analysis measuring business costs and taxes and incentives in one market versus another that the qualitative parts of site selection really have to do with measuring workforce and transportation and infrastructure assets and and other issues related to the overall business climate are regulators and elected officials working with business to create a strong and sustainable economy or are they treating business really as the enemy as we see in a number of states around the country today and in terms of you know site selection, the, the, the two biggest factors are usually workforce and real estate. Okay, companies are only as good as their people. Uh, we're living at a time where technology is disrupting every sector of our economy. So it's creating a new demand for skill sets and things like artificial intelligence and robotics and cybersecurity. And with real estate, it's really about shovel-ready sites that can accommodate the needs of site-seeking companies today. Okay, but uh, so they're looking for shovel-ready sites, but that has to be within an area where they want, you know, the, the county, the city, the planners want that business. So that brings us to California. We keep hearing about this exodus. Is that really true? We are seeing the continued exodus of talent, of companies, of taxable income leaving California. You know, we talk about the challenges on the industrial real estate front. Now, there are growing NIMBY pressures, even amongst areas in California that have really been bright spots with respect to distribution of warehousing. Uh, there's a, a really strong uh, attitude against more distribution centers in Riverside and San Bernardino counties. You have the new quota system that's making it more costly to do distribution projects in California. Uh, you know, that said, uh, California is too important of, an, of a market to simply write off. It's the fifth largest mm-hmm. economy in the world. It's home to uh, great skill sets and artificial intelligence, particularly the Silicon Valley area, and of course, unique accesses to the global marketplace. But there are, there have been a number of states that really have been the big beneficiary of the out-migration of of young talent uh, leaving California in recent years. Yeah, Texas and Florida come to mind. Are there, are there specific parts of Texas and Florida or other states uh, where these companies are headed? Well, Texas and Florida were number one and number two on U-Haul's last latest index yeah. uh, where people are moving to. A couple of, of regions that come to mind in, in Texas and central Texas, the SH-130 corridor that links two of the fastest growing, most dynamic markets in the country today, Austin and San Antonio. 
that region is home to major trophy projects like Samsung and Tesla and Toyota and a number of other in interesting manufacturing projects. That area also is the, is is a area that's seeing a lot of new residential and new office development activity. It's a model for what's termed intelligent infrastructure. Okay, that corridor can really accommodate hydrogen vehicles and EV vehicles and a lot of the uh, traffic mitigation uh, areas that are really the, the focus now for you know, intelligent city planning. And another market that, that comes to mind is, is Northern Nevada, okay? Uh, that Reno market has been a big beneficiary of tech companies and talent leaving the Bay Area. Nevada, of course, no personal or corporate income tax. And Reno is a very high growth market. Just yesterday, uh, Gina, uh, Gina Raimondo was in Reno and made it official, $21 million of new grants to really further accelerate the lithium battery industry in northern Nevada. So we're seeing a lot of those sub-markets south along that 580 corridor uh, into Carson City, the state capital, and into Douglas County. Minden, Nevada is an interesting market with a lot of available land and really beautiful views of the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's an area that we spend a lot of time in for our site-seeking companies. We just did a, uh, you know, one of our major clients is UPS, who's doing a major new project in Minden, not, not far from the airport there. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. You just made my day. You just made my day. We have a development in Carson City that slowed down during the pandemic. Uh, it was just tough to get uh, materials and labor. And uh, we were we were a little bit surprised because we knew the growth that was happening there. But what I'm hearing is that might be turning around. This is a residential project uh, that we're halfway through. And of course, interest rates didn't help. But I've heard about the growth happening in the area, and I'm glad to hear that it's still continuing. Yes, a massive ways of, of growth is is entering into that area, and uh, you know you look at all of the related office and housing projects associated with you know, the enormous growth of that area's data data center industry, and a lot of the advanced manufacturing. That lithium tech hub designation is very significant, and it results in a real need for brick and or, brick and mortar office projects to qualify mm -hmm. for a lot of those funds. Whether it be R and D or office, you actually need to have a physical office. And that area is really primed to, to, to get a lot of interesting projects. A lot of top developers are looking to do new mixed-use projects in that region also. And yeah, come on, you, you mentioned Carson City, one of the great, best steakhouses in America, at Fandango Casino. Dukes, I'm what? sure you've been there. I did not know that. It's a great spot. And what a great hey, view of the Sierra Nevada, Nevada Mountains. You think of an office view. I mean, some of the most gorgeous views in the country, whether it be you know looking out at Biscayne Bay or – sitting in Jersey City looking across the Hudson River or San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. It's tough to beat that view of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And proximate no, also Lake Tahoe. So. Yeah, and our project in, in Carson City is walking distance from the state capitol, from, from all those fun restaurants and, and bars downtown. So we were a little surprised that things slowed down, but I, I'm excited that maybe they'll, they are starting to pick up again. Um, of course, interest rates were, were a killer in, in some areas. And I'm super excited to say that we have a great team that we work with in San Antonio. We're doing a bunch of build to rent there in the outer lying areas of San Antonio. So coming back to that, does it, uh, is it all of San Antonio or mainly that corridor? Uh, I mean, obviously it would spread around, right? Just We, we talk about that corridor but, because it, it houses a lot of available real estate at a lower cost, less congested profile versus the I-35 corridor. It's also home to mega sites in areas like Taylor and Lockhart, where a lot of the major industrial projects are going and a lot of the new mixed use housing activity is going. But Kathy, you, you pick winners, uh, you know, Northern Nevada and, and obviously that San Antonio market, it's really become a, a real growth engine in its own right. No longer in the shadow of Austin, San Antonio is a, a major city. Uh, it's in discussion for new NFL and uh, potential MLB franchises. So a lot of exciting things are happening there. It's very confirming because we're literally tying up the land right now. And of course, there's always some fear involved in that. Like, am I right? But I, I love I love hearing this. Okay, so let's see. What other factors are driving most site selection decisions today? What what are big corporations looking well, at? It really comes down to, to workforce and to, and to real estate. And I mentioned the disruptive effect of of technology creating demands for new skill sets. With respect to industrial real estate, it's about shovel-ready sites that can accommodate the water and power and broadband 
needs for major projects like chip production. It's a major bipartisan effort to reshort chip facilities like Samsung and Micron and Global Foundries uh, and, and Intel back to the U.S. Those require shovel-ready uh, mega sites over a thousand acres. Uh, also, for for office, there's really what we term you know a flight to quality. It's no longer enough to have an, a class A building. You really need a class A plus building that has the types of amenities mm. that will make it easier for companies to get their workers back in the office. You know, and and let, let's be honest mm-hmm. here. There's a lot of uncertainty today about the economy with with interest rates, with inflation, with political uncertainty, both domestically and geopolitically. A lot of projects are really have hit the pause button. Okay, as we get a better sense of what the political and economic outlook will be. And a big part of that is mortgage rates. Okay, it's a major challenge today to convince employees to relocate with the company. Okay, nine out of 10 transferees are currently locked into a mortgage at 6% or less. So to ask them to relocate into a high growth area with affordability issues and soaring childcare costs and soaring healthcare costs. That, that mortgage issue is, is a real issue for site selection projects today. And then it's another under the radar screen reason why a lot of companies are really uh, pressing the pause button on planned relocations or expansions. And maybe choosing more affordable areas? Like what about North Dallas, almost to the Oklahoma border? We also have a, a rental fund there. We bought a bunch of single family homes and um, in our rental fund in a little town sure. called Sherman, because there's chip manufacturing going there. I mean, is that, I think for them, it was access to water. They need so much water for chip manufacturing. Uh, but it, what about that sort of Dallas, That's Oklahoma? Great market. And you're right, it's a federally area. designated chip designation. Uh, of course, Texas Instruments, a massive uh, investment there. Uh, and those, those Dallas northern suburbs also, McKinney, Plano, Frisco, are all high growth areas, a lot of exciting new development activity happening in those markets. And Oklahoma is, is, is really growing. It's, it's technology industries and film and multimedia. So that's another winning market, Kathy. Congratulations on uh, that Sherman, uh, <laughs> North Texas area. Oh, we're so excited. We got in when the market was kind of frozen a couple of years ago, and we just, oh, man, Wonderful. we killed it on uh, on acquisition. It was, we were buying homes under a hundred thousand, if you can imagine, right next to these huge billion, multi-billion dollar chip manufacturing plants. So what types of industries are, uh, you know, are, are growing? I, th- I think you said industrial, we're, are, are we reshoring more? And if so, where? And does that mean industrial is going to pop? We well? are reshoring chip production, roughly 12% of chips today are manufactured in the U.S. The goal is to double that by the end of the decade. There have been a recent wave of high-profile chip expansions like Micron and Intel and Samsung and Global Foundries. We expect to see more of that. Every consumer project uses, or every consumer electronic project uh, product uses chips, as well as the aerospace and automotive industries and medical devices. So we see you know, more room for growth on, on the chip front. Uh, Health tech is another big growth industry, okay? The, the marriage of technology and cybersecurity with, with healthcare. The space industry is an exciting growth industry. Energy industry, we're looking at hydrogen emerge as a really high growth sector, particularly in Texas. Um, and the film and multimedia industry, okay? Film and multimedia is a very dynamic industry. There's synergies with software and app development that's interesting. It's not just Hollywood A-listers like Mark Wahlberg and Jeremy Renner that are ditching California because of high taxes. It's also the production crews that are dealing with affordability issues. So you have a number of states like Oklahoma and Georgia and New Jersey that are investing in in film incentives. New Jersey just has the new uh, Netflix studio at Fort Monmouth, AC, uh, 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 AC1X Studios at the Old Steel Pier in Atlantic City. You have the Lionsgate studio in Newark. You have. Well, that's shocking. New Jersey isn't exactly a low tax state. Why no. would they be moving their operations there? It seems one, like it one would thing be just Governor as bad. Murphy got right was the need for very powerful film industry incentives. He's been very proactive on that front. And New Jersey has a lot of just diverse you know, multimedia talent. So they have, it fills that workforce quotient. Uh, you think about the Jersey shoreline, which 
lends itself well to a lot of film and multimedia uh, creation. But you know, mm-hmm. Texas is another state. Okay, that is interesting. Texas last year passed a two hundred million dollar film incentive. It was championed by a a lot of A listers like wow. Dennis Quaid and Matthew McConaughey. You know, two of Texas's favorite sons that want to bring production to Texas. Uh, a number of new film studios in, in San Marcos and, and Bastrop, a high growth Austin suburb. Texas just attracted nineteen twenty three, the popular Netflix series, the spinoff of, of Yellowstone. And they keep an eye on, on Nevada also. Okay, our our old client Howard Hughes is developing a new film studio studio in Summerlin. That's going to be a, a project to watch, especially as new film incentives come on stream through the Nevada legislature. Might not be this year, may not be next year, but by the end of the decade, we project very powerful film incentives to to finally make its way through the Nevada legislature. Yeah, this is really an interesting trend, especially for California, where we're talking about Hollywood having been the hub for for film production for a decade. I mean, a decade, a, a century. Uh, and all of a sudden, people, you know, these companies starting to spread out and and Hollywood losing control when you've got so you've got so many different companies getting into the game with Netflix and Amazon and oh, probably missing some. And then you go to Northern California, where it was always the tech hub, and that's spreading out. So it seems like in the past, um, it, p- companies want to be next to each other, right? They want to be able to bump into someone at the coffee shop or go t- go to a meeting that's just down the street. So when it's more spread out across the country, how does that work? I mean, will there be a new hub or will it just continue well, right. to I spread mean, out? Clustering serves a purpose. It's about you know pooling skill sets, expanding labor markets, partnering with academic centers of excellence. Again, it comes down to those partnerships between the private sector and the academic sector and the real estate sector. But where you are seeing this sort of spread out of impact is really re- related to how companies view offices today. Okay, really is not necessarily a centralized hub that houses 90% of your workforce, but really spreading these hubs out into, da- into different geographies to tap into local talent pools, uh, to create partnerships with different types of markets, uh, as well as universities or other research institutions. Uh, and then, of course, you have the hybrid working, which really is consistent with that, where companies can really reduce their brick and mortar class A real estate obligations with smaller satellite offices around the country, markets that are in in pro-business areas with favorable tax structures, favorable regulations, and high in-migration rates that make it easier to transfer workers in out of higher tax states. Well, with these high growth states, let's talk about Florida and Texas, who are, they, they just keep coming out on top. What kind of challenges are they facing and how will those areas change as a result of all this growth? Like well, the, the, the two biggest challenges are possible. affordability and, and infrastructure. Okay. This is a, a situation impacting a lot of the high growth yeah. markets in the Sun Belt. And with respect to affordability, it's not just housing, it's insurance. Okay. The, the insurance crisis is real. Florida is ground zero for the insurance crisis. Rates are averaging, property insurance rates are averaging $11,000 a year. That's over four times the national average. And fortunately, both parties in Florida understand that. that there was a, a, some good legislation that came out of Tallahassee this year to really limit uh, third-party funded lawsuits and really focus on tort reform to make the state more competitive for more private carriers to enter the state. And private carriers are entering the state. So... There is reason to be optimistic. This will take time, but at least the legislature understands the need for tort reform. Uh, the other issue is investing in infrastructure, and, and Florida has done a great job in investing in infrastructure, whether it be expanding I-4 in central Florida or Brightline. Okay, Brightline has been a national model of high-speed rail done right. It's a, it's The success of, in Florida has finally helped uh, it, this uh, happen connecting LA and Vegas. That was long planned. Now it is happening. A big part of that is, is the confidence that, that investors have uh, after looking at how successful it's been in Florida, really you know, cross-pollinating the central Florida market and economic development assets in greater Orlando with South Florida. And also eventually the Space Coast and Brevard County, all the way west on I-4 into Tampa. And you think about Bright Lines be, being a catalyst for mixed-use transit-orientated development, similar to what we saw in states along the Northeast Corridor and in New York and Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Connecticut over the past five decades. That's now happening 
in Florida. And it's going to happen along the I-15 corridor once, once Brightline goes west, linking Vegas and Los Angeles, finally. <laughs> I was going to say, um, what is it, San Francisco connecting to L.A.? How long has that been in, in pro process and, and the costs are astronomical and people are asking, why do we even need a train? Like, why, why does that matter to have a high-speed train? You're right. I mean, I think San Francisco to, to, to LA is, is a bit different. There are, there are nonstop flights. Um, but you think about how many folks drive from, from Southern California to Vegas. Vegas has really become one of the most dynamic growth markets in the world right now. Uh, th there is a need, I think, for rail today versus even a decade ago. Uh, and again, the success of Brightline in Florida really gives confidence to a lot of other real estate developers and to kind of reimagine what transit development can look like in that part of the country, connecting you know, Los Angeles, Southern California with Vegas. A lot of those secondary tertiary growth markets along I-15 will be ground zero for a lot of new speculative, for a lot of new uh, development activity related to transit. Interesting. I know um, my daughter has a, a business and in, in selling international real estate, and she's been very focused on Mexico and specifically Cancun to Tulum and the new train system going in there. Do you do you know much about that and and what Mexico is doing to improve their transport? I know Mexico has been investing in infrastructure, uh, improving their utility grids. Nearshoring is a major priority for both Mexico and the U.S. and Canada. Okay. Uh, you look at the synergies between Monterey with Texas, the, the new Port to Plains corridor connecting Laredo uh, all the way up uh, to the uh, Colorado border. Uh, you think about the SH-130 corridor tapping into synergies in Mexico and a lot of supplier activity for automotive and aerospace and medical devices. So Mexico is uh, an, an interesting market and it's, it's front and center for companies that want to uh, get out of China get out of riskier, lower cost areas in Asia and and take advantage of some of the nearshore incentives and relationships that Mexico enjoys with, with the U.S. Climate change. Is this something that corporations are looking at? Because you're, you know, we're talking Florida and Texas having such high growth and yet Florida is sort of ground zero for for windstorms and, and hurricanes and Texas for heat. It is. So is I mean, every company has different priorities, but we are seeing Cities around the country really aggressively promote themselves as being havens for executives and workers concerned about climate change. Buffalo has a an, an initiative to promote its abundance of water as a as a industry and people attraction tool. Uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan have similar programs. Uh, every project is different. You know, I'll say this: yes, there are man-made. Yes, this is an, a great area to edit. Uh, I have to take there, but yes, there are natural disasters <laughs> like hurricanes and wildfires, and they tend to dominate the 24-hour news cycle. But there's also man-made disasters like bad policy that encourages shoplifting, that makes insurance rates skyrocket, and makes markets like San Francisco inhospitable to small businesses. There's there's man-made disasters like bad policy that let tort lawyers run amok and engage in third-party funded litigation. So companies need to kind of walk and chew gum at the same time and balance all of this out and realize that, yes, there's natural disasters. There's also man-made disasters. There's consequences of bad policy, whether that be never-ending tax and spend policy and over-regulating, uh, as well as policies that don't really uh, emphasize law and order and enforcing the law. Oh, got it. Okay, well, this is your firm's 50th anniversary, and you joined the firm back in 2002. What are a couple of projects that you're that are especially noteworthy and uh, and have special significance to you? I would say, you know, contributing uh, research and analysis to the World Bank, to the President's National Economic Council, to MIT's Work of the Future program have been rewarding experiences. If I were to name it, just a few projects, I would say, you know, we've had two projects announced in the White House in a matter of less than three years from one another. One is Culver City-based Moldex, who at the end of the Trump administration got a Department of Defense grant to uh, ramp up production of N95 masks. And under our current president, we did the Tritium Project, 
uh, which was announced in the White House, a battery manufacturing company. Uh, both of those projects ended up in Middle Tennessee. I'm also proud of our longstanding relationships with Dell and with, with UPS. We've done dozens of projects for those companies over the years, looking at locations around the globe. And lastly, Shell. Okay, We've done a number of really innovative projects for Shell, helping them transition into the emerging energy industry. Uh, I'm sorry, helping them uh, emerge into the, helping them expand in the emerging hydrogen industry. And a lot of those projects actually in California and in Sacramento, which has been a center of excellence for their, their hydrogen program. Wow. That's, that's amazing. So let's talk about energy then. Do you see North Dakota um, ever coming back? Yeah, you know, uh, there's just, just a study I saw. North Dakota is actually ranked among the top locations for young uh, relocating professionals that prioritize outdoor living. That's an interesting dynamic. It's a pro-business state with a growing energy industry. And the great thing about energy, there's so many synergies with other types of industries, like cybersecurity. Okay, so that's a will continue to be a high growth industry. Uh, of course, it, it's suffering from a lot of the challenges of other hyper growth areas with respect to affordability. But I suspect as financing rates come down and more inventory comes on comes in the mix. Uh, that's a market that will continue to, to to grow and be successful. Specifically in in the oil and gas market, or just in general. Well, yeah, you know, a lot of that will depend upon what the next administration looks like. Okay, uh, so mm -hmm. when I talk about a lot of projects hitting the pause button, there is this wait and see approach. What will the next administration look like? How will oil and gas be regulated or incentivized versus the previous administration? These are all dynamics that are playing out. But, you know, hydrogen is an interesting growth industry in its own right, particularly for aviation and for 18-wheelers. wheel, 18 -wheelers. And that's a market that has a lot of things going for it on that, on that respect. Interesting. Okay. Well, John, it is always such a pleasure to have you here on The Real Well Show. Any final thoughts for, for our listeners who are tend to be in, resident, in the residential space? I mean, it sounds like a lot of site selection on the commercial side and the corporate side is, is looking at the housing side as well. They want their employees to be able to live a comfortable life and be able to afford the cost of living. So any last comments to our listeners who are really heavily invested in residential? You know, you know, housing is a critical part of the equation for site-seeking companies. Uh, we don't expect any significant rate cuts this year. Uh, however, uh, 2025, uh, God willing, there will be a rate, rate cuts. Uh, and then, you know, challenges come with that also because it could take us back into that area where there's bidding wars again. But, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, and in the meantime, look, you know, the, the markets that are winning the battle for corporate investment and jobs today are markets that really embrace regionalism. Okay, site-seeking companies want the broadest inventory of real estate, of workforce, and infrastructure assets uh, as possible. Great. All right, John. Well, thank you again for being here on The Real Wealth Show. We really just love having you here. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to learn more about some of these exciting projects we're doing in the San Antonio area, just join Real Wealth if you haven't already. It's free to join. That will get you on our newsletter and we'll be announcing it there. We are currently acquiring a few parcels of land where we're doing build to rent in a syndication, but we also have a team there if you just want to buy property on your own. They provide duplexes, fourplexes, and high growth areas, and they buy down the rate. They spend a lot of money doing that to make it cash flow better for you. Uh, last week, it was as low as four and a quarter percent that you could get without you paying points. They're paying the points. So if you want to find out more, just go to realwealthshow.com. You have to join first, and then you'll get access to that San Antonio page, or you can just reach out to one of our investment counselors to find out more. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks again for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show, and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.